All right, I'll um, I will talk a little bit about transformation from a should I say from a slightly more sort of theoretical point of view, giving you a bit of IMD's perspective on the topic, but I will spend the bulk of my time sharing a example of a transformation. Uh, from my time when I was not with IMD, but actually a client of IMD. Because I think we can talk a lot about transformation from a theoretical point of view, but it's in reality and the tough experience of going through it, I think the greatest learnings are. I'm a very informal person. I love it when it becomes big and hefty discussions, all right? Because my, uh, you know, my, my passion for HR is very, very strong. I think it's illustrated, forgive me now, for showing a picture of my family, all right? But I've spent 25 years in human resources. I've been a CHRO for 12 years in three different companies. Uh, so sort of my heart and my soul is in human resources. I worked in human resources in Sweden, in the UK, in the US, and Latin America. Uh, and again, that's sort of where my passion is. I've been with IMD for two years. Um, I guess I came to that stage in my career and my life where I felt like I wanted to transform myself. I wanted to do something radically different. So I was on a hike in the Swiss mountains with a, you know, with a professor from IMD. I had worked with a lot as a client. And I said to him, next year I will jump. I will stop being an, an HR director and I will do something very different. And then he asked me, so what are you gonna do? And I said, I will chill. <laughs> <laughs> I would just take it easy for a year and see what sort of comes to me. And then he said, well, I have an idea already now. And that is that you come to IMD. And then you can take the first year to just stop and reflect and do research and go to programs and talk to professors. And after that, we'll see. And that's what I decided to do. And that was two, two and a half years ago. Now I'm a senior advisor at IMD, which means that I meet and work with clients that are mainly going through big transformations. And I do so from the perspective of uh, discussing, asking questions, and making sure that what we do as a partner is less focused on the programs only. You know, many people associate IMD you know, with programs. But when I was a client, the reason why I thought IMD was so wonderful to work with was that they were very much a sounding board to me, asking a lot of questions, allowing me to see how the different change initiatives needed to be coordinated, and also allowing me to tap into the organization, and I'll talk more about that later, sort of looking to realize this transformation through our own people, much more so than consultants. And that's what I do uh, at IMD now, working with other clients. This picture is up because I'm so passionate about human resources that I'm even married to a CHRO. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which was not intentional. I love her for who she is, not because she works in HR, but I just give it as an example of you know, my, my passion for the topic. Some of you may wonder, I don't know if any one of you have this experience, but what is it like for a child to grow up with two HR professionals? <laughs> Does any one of you have that experience? No. Let me give you an anecdote that illustrates what it can be like, okay? This is Ella, our oldest daughter. She is now 18 years old. At the time of the example I will share with you, she was 16. We were sitting at the dinner table, and she was very, very upset with her Spanish teacher. She was upset because she felt that the, that the Spanish teacher had no rigor or discipline to her teaching. She had been upset about this for a while, but now she was supposed to have a test on a Friday she had studied two weeks in advance. She was fully prepared. And she, here comes Friday, and there's no test. The teacher had simply forgot about it. So she was livid. So at the dinner table, she said, time's up. She needs to be fired. I will speak to the headmaster on Monday, and I will require this to happen. 
okay, two HR professionals at the dinner table. My wife and I look at each other. <laughs> she gives me the nod and I turn to Ella and I say, now hold your horses. The first thing you need to do is that you need to approach the Spanish teacher. You need to give her constructive, developmentally oriented feedback. <laughs> and you need to give her six to eight weeks to respond. So you can see if she can actually perform better. Not until then can we talk about what the next steps are. I saw this loving look from my wife and I got a nod back of confirmation. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Three weeks passes and we thought this was all over. And then I get a call to my office. It's the headmaster. <laughs> the headmaster had just come out of a meeting with Ella. And the headmaster said, I've just had a very fascinating meeting with your daughter. She was very frustrated about the Spanish teacher. She said, I give you, I'm fine, I'm fine, no, I'm good. She said, <laughs> Our, your daughter said to me that I give you two options. One option is that you fire her. A second, or sorry, I give you two options. One is that you put her in another position where she works with a Spanish teacher, work with smaller kids doing lesser damage. <laughs> okay, that was one option. The second option is that you consider early retirement because as per my information, she's 62 and a half. This is this, is this wonderful, sweet girl speaking at the age of 16. And then, you know, the headmaster, of course, asked us, I have to ask you, what is your profession? <laughs> and I, I decided to answer back with half of the truth, and that was to say that my wife is a CHRO. <laughs> so that, that is what it might do for you if you've got two HR professionals in the family. Um, that's about me, uh, very open, very informal. Uh, let's make this a joyful learning session for us all, because I also look forward to learn a lot from you. Very briefly about IMD. IMD is a business school based out of Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, counter to many schools, we work with executive education almost only. Uh, the program that we have that is a running program uh, that sort of gives you know degree is the MBA program uh, where we have 90 students. It's the executive MBA program where we have do you know, Stain, how many? 150. So we're very sort of small in the degree program space, and we're very big in the executive development space. Uh, on open programs, we've been ranked first by Financial Times for, what is it, seven consecutive years. We're also big, and we're growing a lot in customized programs, which means that we work with organizations going through transformation. We have a faculty of about 54 professors, a very diverse group of people in terms of nationality. There is a Swiss middle-aged man who is a professor, and he always starts his sessions at IMD by saying, I am a Swiss middle-aged man in a Swiss business school, and I'm a minority. <laughs> <laughs> which is a quite nice thing to say. So it's a very diverse group of people. We pride ourselves in being very innovative and trying to work with our clients based on their needs and doing, a, do, doing this in a very sort of innovative and creative way. That's as much as I intend to say about IMD. About the world. <laughs> uh, this and we talked, about, we talked about the crazy world that we live in with sort of the pace of change seemingly ever increasing and the different trends hitting us and influencing us being almost endless. And this is just an illustration from an organization that went through an exercise that IMD turns around with clients that is called Global Signals. So you identify all the trends that are around you, and then you have discussions and you gradually move towards the trends that are most relevant to your business. So this is one business that have gone through this exercise and concluded, if you look at the big ones, that there are certain trends that are more relevant for this organization than others. 
but it's just to say that the world you know, is going through enormous change, both looking at pace and looking at the different changes that are affecting us. It doesn't necessarily mean hitting us, but affecting us. OK. Also, if you look at this, and I think your comments in the, uh, in the introduction it sort of represents very, very much what we hear when we talk about CHROs, and that is that transformation is the new normal. Uh, it's almost impossible to find organizations today that are saying that, you know, for us it's fairly stable actually. <laughs> Everyone is talking about transformation and transformation that is huge. You know, this reskilling of your workforce, which many talk about, can be a monumental challenge. The pace of change and the pace of innovation hitting you from startups that are so much faster than you, it almost becomes you know, impossible to compare, etc. So this is from a research study uh, by Harvard Business uh, Review that was published uh, late last year. And it says that all but 3% have just gone out of, or in the middle of, or are looking at stepping into a significant transformation. So it's sort of the, the new normal, if you wish. And then, not to put you down, but it's certainly not easy. And this is uh, from research done by a professor at IMD, uh, where he looked at a large number of organizations that in the last 10 years have gone through significant transformation, looking at the success rate. And sadly enough, it says that about 75% of all transformation efforts till da to date have actually failed. Failed as in you have significantly gone in under the objective defined, or you've even abandoned the, the transformation completely. So this is, this is a research study that was done over four years with numerous researchers involved, and this is the fairly sad result coming out of it. Does this surprise you, or? Not really. Not really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's not intended to put you down, but I think if there is a message in here, it is certainly that we need to look at ways to do this better. Because it can be done better. If you turn it around, you can say that a quarter apparently succeeded. And this is going to determine whether an organization not just survives, but actually wins in the future. And I'll come back to that. And for the good and the bad, HR's role is key. Not to go into the details of this study, but uh, some of the things that are said in the study that I think is interesting is, first, organizations tend to fail because they go after too much. It's a bit back to this illustration of the many, many different trends out there that organizations struggle to sort of stop, make sense out of it, and dare to focus on few things. So they go after too much. So they exhaust the organization. There's a recent study that, shows, that, that looks specifically at the reasons why that goes deep into this exhaustion that you oftentimes find in organizations. You run so many projects that you're not focused and the energy is not there. You, can't, you fail to compete because you're simply going after too much. So that's one key message. Go after some few quests, as they refer to. The second one is, if you don't focus on leadership and selective capability building, the transformation won't succeed and it will certainly not last. So it points to evidence of the enormous importance of leadership to be successful as you transform. And it also points to the importance of building very select capabilities that will make you compete and win. Don't go too broad, but go for some selected capabilities that you deem are critical for you to win. And again, it's sort of back to this illustration of it's OK, there's a gazillion things happening in the world. But given who you are and who you want to be, what are the trends that are most critical to you? 
If you want to compete successfully in that landscape, what capabilities do you need to build? Don't go after too much. Okay, I'll just say some words about our view, as in IMD's view, and what we believe very, very strongly in. And I will sort of reinforce this also from my personal perspective, because I've been much more a client to IMD than I have been an employee of IMD. And then I'll go into a case that is a case I've experienced that is very real and that will be told in a rough way, not in a rosy way, because it wasn't a rosy case. Okay? Does that sound okay? All right. So the idea and the learnings that we have had is that, you know, if you, and I don't mean to be rude to any consultant in the room here, so I, I just want to make that point very clear because this is, in some ways, a slight generalization. But what you see oftentimes in corporations that we discuss with is that they may make their transformation very much dependent on selected strategic or business transformation consultants. So they bring in a lot of extraordinarily bright people to address particular topics, as referred to here as a consultancy intervention, and they might get business impact without a doubt. The problem is that you might not get a learning impact and thereby sort of build that stickiness in terms of the capabilities that you need to build to, to make this transformation or change last. But it, so, so that is the point around, if you only go consultancy intervention, you miss out on the learning impact for the organization. And you might get a, sh a, sh a short to midterm impact, but it's really lasting because the stickiness in terms of the learning, the organizational learning, and the individual learning isn't there. Skills training, on the other hand, if that is what you try to do, and you do too much of that, it might oftentimes have a limited business impact because you tend to go deep into building skills. And yes, there are certainly examples where you build very relevant skills for the organization. But if you don't connect this with the business impact that you're there to create, the impact tends to be a lot less. We believe that if you actually manage to put yourself into this space, where you work with the client organization, and they make their transformation more dependent on their own people, but that the people involved are provided with the skills, the means, they're simply enabled to drive this transformation, you will get the business impact and you will get the learning impact and the stickiness. And I'll share with you some examples of this that are very concrete and to the point. But that's sort of the idea. We want to be up here as an institution we're sometimes too much in this space. That's not where we want to be. I would even say, Stain, you, <laughs> you can hit me if you think I'm inappropriate, but I think if we're only in this space, we might be overpriced. But if we manage to move up into this space, we are a bargain, we argue. Are you with me so far? Is the food nice? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My vegetarian sandwich was also wonderful, so <laughs> feel no empathy. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, one more thing on, uh, on sort of the process, and this might look like a bit of a busy and complicated slide, and uh, forgive me, because that's not at all the intent. But this is to say, okay, if we go in and work with a client, how would we do it? Well, the first thing that we would do is to try to create an understanding of the organization. So you do a lot of diagnostics, you do a lot of interviews, you try to figure out the DNA, the uniqueness of this organization. So that's where we start. The second place where we go is that we try to broaden up the lens as much as we can. So, you know, if you work in the banking sector, and you, we're seeing an opportunity for this company, well, we don't necessarily go in and compare with other banks, but we compare with other industries. And we try to push the perspectives open as much as we possibly can. In this case, from our own experience, we also try to make the executives interact with people that are further down in the organization, closer to the customer, further down in production, 
we bring in people from all around just to make the perspectives be as mixed and as diverse as they possibly can be. Once you sort of know more, the, the question then is, how do you actually converge? So how do you bring this down to where our focus shall be and start to make decisions? That is when you start to make sense of this world that is so seemingly complicated that you feel like there's no chance we can succeed in this. But that is when you've broadened a perspective around certain selected critical trends and you're starting to see where the opportunities are and you start to get a focus, a strategy for what you shall do. And the last stage is all about acceleration and enabling the organization, not least empower the organization to succeed. It's sort of a process flow that I will now illustrate with an example. OK. Does anyone know what company Stura Enzo is? You do? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. It's Storenzo sort of prouds itself to be the oldest company in the world in the sense that there's been a share found from 1288. As you can imagine, I started later. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's supposedly the oldest company in the world. Back to this process, to sort of understand how to best drive a transformation, you need to understand the unique context of this industry, of this organization, its recent history, etc. And that is what I will share with you now. So I'll say some things about the unique context for this organization. And you will also learn what was the reason why this organization needed to transform. And then I'll share with you some on the approach and some on impact. And then I'll move into what do I think given what I've set up front and also from this case is the role that HR should play. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. Storenzo, short facts, in addition to being founded in 1288, it's a company that sits on enormous assets of land. Land can be owned or land can be long leased. Long leased mean in China, for example, you can't own land. You can long lease it for 100 to 150 years. So Storenzo sits on enormous assets of long leased land in China or own land in Northern Europe. On that land, they grow trees. From trees, you can make a lot of stuff. Stuff can be buildings, as in you know, houses that are either one-story houses or there are 14-story houses all built out of tree very environmentally friendly. You can make books, you can make packaging solutions that is not least now extremely profitable because our shopping patterns are so distinctively different. Uh, I don't think I need to take it any further than that. If you look at the sales, 10.5 billion, an operating EBIT at 1.3, about 26,000 employees. The biggest countries now would be China, Brazil, Uruguay, followed by Finland and Sweden. The, con uh, the company is listed in Finland as its primary listing and Stockholm as its secondary listing. The ownership structure is also important to mention because the company is owned not only, but the dominant owners are the Wallenberg family. Does anyone know about the Wallenberg family? They're a very, very wealthy family that sits on assets in AstraZeneca, Ericsson, Electrolux, almost like all big northern European companies. They own big assets. The second significant owner is the Finnish state. The reason why this is so relevant is because it brings a long-term perspective to a transformation that I think oftentimes you're in need of to succeed. If you live with a very short-sighted monthly, quarterly type of, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's for sure difficult. OK. Are you with me? Cool. Why is Durenza had to transform? At the time when this happened, Storenzo had 
And I'll be, I'll be rough in my explanations, but I want to just keep it, because I don't think any transformation is smooth. So I want to deliberately also portray this exactly as it was, because it wasn't smooth. Okay. So about 2001, 2002, we started to see e-media come through at a time when Storenza's strategy was all about paper. So Storenza's strategy was to become the largest <coughs> paper company in the world. That was the strategy in 2002. And then this started to happen. Whilst this picture is from 2012, you started to see behaviors in terms of how you pick up news, etc., change radically. So it's 2002, this starts to happen, and it starts to disrupt an organization that is all about paper. What do you think the company did? in 2002 when this started to happen. Do Sorry? Do you define the issue? Uh, you mean defend or no, no, no. diversify the business? No, we didn't. So what do you, what do you think we did? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> We didn't, we, well, we didn't do that really in 2002 either. To a degree, yes, but not that much. So what do you think we did? I wasn't in the company back then, but what do you think we did? Call a big four consultant firm. <laughs> 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 we, di we did do that a little bit later. <laughs> but, uh, but we didn't do anything. So why do you think the company didn't do anything? Because it was a temporary situation. S sorry? They thought they were, it was a temporary situation. Exactly. So there, you know, this case has actually been written about from many different perspectives. You know, there's been a book written about the whole case. Uh, there's been HBR, Harvard Business Reviews articles that I've co-written one. There's been articles about this transformation. But one of the reasons why nothing was done was that the supervisory board was composed of what? People within you know, a, a very significant experience from this industry. They had very, very strong paper, slight packaging experience. So they knew this industry. They knew that extraordinarily well. The executive team at this time as was written in one of the articles in a not so nice way, were all born and raised in a paper mill. So the lack of diversity in the supervisory board and the executive team brought a bit of a paralysis to a disruption. It's like you were hit in the face, but you didn't really know what the alternative route was, so you didn't really do anything. And as you said, there was this conviction that this is cyclical. So yeah, the demand for paper is going to drop for a little while, and then it's going to come back up again. If you look in the rear mirror, it sounds pretty stupid, doesn't it? You know, if you think now, yeah, the demand for paper and the price is going to go up like crazy. It makes all the sense in the world. It doesn't make that much sense. The message here is, if you talk about diversity and you don't say, manage to position it, as something extraordinarily important, I can tell you that one of the big reasons why the company was on the verge of bankruptcy in the end was because of the lack of diversity. Too many people thought alike at the top and couldn't see what to actually do with this. Okay, now we're gonna see, you know, with, with, with HR professionals in the room, this is gonna be easy, okay? So, we're in 2006, the company had not done much. The company had started to do certain savings. The company had picked up the phone and brought consultants in, but the, 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 the business was still struggling very much. And that was because the company still kept to the strategy that says, we shall be global, the biggest player in paper. So they still stuck with that. So in 2006, the situation was just extraordinarily difficult. And the supervisory board decided to fire the CEO and bring in a new. My question to you is, what kind of sort of capabilities and experiences do you think they were looking for with the new CEO? Nothing to do with the position. <laughs> yes. 
they, <laughs> they didn't want to have someone who was born and raised in the paper mill. So they wanted to have someone from a different industry. Absolutely. What else? Yes. Transformation wasn't really used as a term back then, but it was very much this. Innovation or? It was more this, we need a turnaround boss. You know, someone who's been turning a bleeding business around, brought it back to profitability. And, and you can say, well, innovation, very important. But the situation was so difficult at this time that it was more the turnaround term that was used. So not industry experience, a turnaround experience. Anything else that springs to mind? mind. Sorry? Digital mind. A digital mind. Yes, they wanted to see someone step into this role that understood more at least of the industry that had disrupted this industry. <coughs> so sort of, let's sleep with the enemy. Let's bring in someone that has a bit of that experience. Anything else? Any thoughts on nationality? Any thoughts on past experience as a CEO? <laughs> no, this was actually very interesting. This I learned afterwards because this, this was before I joined. They wanted to have a Swede or a Finn. You, uh, any guess? You know, of course, Swedish because people. They are <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I say I was fishing Sorry. for that answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they, the the thing was this: the Vallenberg family, whilst not being the state, they're almost like, you know, a body above. So they are state-like, royal-like. The second biggest donor is the Finnish state. They are state. They wanted to bring in a Finn or a Swede because they knew that the CEO that steps in will impose enormous pain on this company and primarily in its home countries, Sweden and Finland, because a lot of the changes were overdue in Sweden and Finland. And they, they were scared that if we bring in an American or any other nationality, that the general public could not accept that this is probably something that is done <coughs> for the good in the longer term. So they wanted, therefore, to have a Finn or a Swede. Do you think they wanted to have an experienced CEO or someone who was a CEO for the first time? Yes, exactly. But they didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a wonderful time to change the perspectives a bit because, yes, they wanted to have an experienced CEO. But how many CEOs do you think were standing there thinking, if I only got that? <laughs> global paper company that is in the brink of ruin kind of job. Wouldn't that be fantastic? You know, I'll go for it any day. So the guy that they hired had never been a CEO before. He was a Finn who had worked outside of Finland for 31 years. He came from a position being responsible for Philips Healthcare, sitting on their executive team and had prior been with ABB, also sitting on their executive team, but he had never been a CEO before. Worth to be noted, his father, had worked for Stora Enso. So he was emotionally connected to the country and emotionally connected to uh, the company. Okay, quickly, in the coming 18 months, he laid off 11,000 people out of about 26. Enormous amounts of negative press. He was voted the most hated man in Finland in 2008. They don't hand that prize out every year, but <laughs> he had the fortune to get it in 2008. Some very few forward-looking investments. But what's very important for context is this. The fight for survival was on, and everything that contributed to survival was applauded. Why would this matter? Why would it matter? Any guess? Short -term Becomes an extremely short-term strategy. So in between 2007 until 2010, every behavior that was about cutting cost, doing the difficult things to save money was, <laughs> that's exactly what we need, okay? It was not a problem then, but it became a huge problem later. <laughs> I joined in 2010 <laughs> and people, <laughs> yeah, I will tell you, uh, a lot of my friends asked, have you totally lost it? <laughs> <laughs> why, why would you go there? 
you know, because this company was then known for the continuous articles about now they're closing this mill, now they're laying off these many people, it's impacting this village. Because whilst this might not look as a village, this is a typical mill that is almost like the church was in a smaller town some X hundred years ago. So when you close down capacity or a mill, you close down a little town. And you get enormous bad press as a consequence of this. OK, we move on. Uh, somewhat later, some, some trends started to appear. And it's back to this enormously busy slide with a gazillion trends. So the supervisory board, then looking different, started to identify some trends that might be important to a company like Storenzo. So why would any one of these trends be relevant for a company like Storenzo? So the fact that e-commerce started to take off brought enormous promise to the packaging business. Absolutely. Then I heard a reference to plastics. It started to come, but it wasn't much, that debates around the climate change and people starting to say, we might be willing to pay a slight premium for something that might stop global warming, or at least slow it down. But back then, there wasn't this actual willingness to pay a premium. So Storenzo lost or did not have a lot of business simply because the, you know, other competing businesses with cheaper type materials was beating us left and right. So it was very difficult to make a profit. But the supervisory board, with the owners having a very, very long-term perspective, said, it's not the case now but it might come. OK, so the conclusion, and this was communicated, when was this? Maybe back in 2010, 11. The company wanted to transform from being a primarily northern European paper company to becoming a global renewable materials company known as the rethinkers of our industry. Cool and different. and. <laughs> All right, so it makes a lot of sense, uh, maybe. <laughs> OK, are you with me so far? That's all I intend to say about context. So a company who'd been fighting for survival are now at a point where actually companies a bit back on track, starting to make a little bit of money. Owners at the top that says, we think there's a business for this company. Um, what else can be said before we move to approach? But this is sort of where we are, and a culture that is extremely short-term oriented. When I joined in 2010, I asked the head of remuneration to give me a copy of the short-term incentive plan for the top 150 and the long-term incentive plan. I got two papers. I read both. I said, it's not the best start in your career working with me because they are identical. And he said, they are identical for a reason because the supervisory board doesn't want the top 150 to focus on anything but the short term. So it's just one year. The three year incentive plan doesn't exist. That's the reason why it looks like it does. So very short term oriented. OK. On that note, uh, this is from an analysis by BCG that shows that oftentimes transformation or large scale change start with the first half that is, let's save the company, because we've been on the wrong, going in the wrong direction for a bit too long. And I think Sturens is just a you know, perfect example of that. So the first part of the transformation is all about getting the destiny back into your own hands. It's tough. It's a turnaround, uh, which again explains why the CEO was hired with you know, that turnaround profile, that was what he was tasked to do. The second is the game changer. That is when you figure out how you best work on your current business whilst at the same time deliver new business. And this is when this becomes extraordinarily critical. 
leadership and developing selected capabilities. Um, forgive me for the bad picture on the left, but this is just to illustrate some of the things, some of the levers that the executive team and the board then in 2000, and uh, it should certainly not be 2020, but the, this is just to point to some of the levers that we used to, that we, that we decided to focus on. Of course, the strategy, looking at how do we change the structure, processes, the rewards, and people, and not least culture. And I will mainly address these three. Okay. Now I shall do two minutes of theater. <laughs> Can you stand two minutes of theater? Okay. Uh, I kindly now ask you to put yourself in the position that you are members of Storenzo's executive committee. It's February 2011. It's after the first half of the transformation, we're just about to move into the second. It's a three-day meeting where the CEO wants to discuss how shall we change the way we act and behave so that we actually can move into the second half and transform this company. That's sort of the backdrop for this meeting. And then he starts the meeting like this. Welcome. The very first thing I would like to say to you is thank you. I would like to thank you for your enormous efforts and hard work in the last three to four years. I know that you have taken decisions and executed upon decisions that has been very painful to you and that has been very painful to people working for you. But now we have taken the company back to a much better position again. For you doing this, I'm eternally grateful. Thank you. The second thing I'd like to say when I look at you is that I know that this is not the executive team that will take this company into the future. <laughs> <laughs> However, I cannot fire you all at once. <laughs> Reason is that we need to manage our current business and we need to start to regain trust with our investors, showing that we can provide profit monthly, quarterly, annually. And for this reason, I need you. I shall also say that I was hired with turnaround boss on my t-shirt. That's what I know. That's what I've done. I have never driven a growth agenda before in my career. I'm scared. If I will get to keep the job, it's up to the supervisory board to decide, so I'm not safe either. With this, let's discuss how we shall change the way we lead this organization going forward. And the meeting started. What do you think about such a way to start that meeting? Not a meeting, but that meeting. Very sincere. <laughs> Half of the table probably gets up and leaves. <laughs> Yeah, very sincere, half of the table probably goes up and leave. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll react to that second reflection in a bit. Uh, but any other, any other thoughts on that way to start the meeting? Probably it was on the air, all that discussion, and everyone thought about the, the same thing. So is there that, uh, and everyone in the same direction? Yeah, that was his argument for saying this. He and I talked a lot prior to the meeting, and he said, this is what I want to say. And I said, God, you're going to scare them to pieces. And he said, but it's the truth. They already know. So why not say it? Um, and we had a lot of discussions back and forth. But his argument was exactly that. I put words to something people already know. To get back to your comment about half the room left, this is a picture taken just after the CEO had opened the meeting in the way that I described. And if you look at this team, I can just say something that has a bit to do with the company wanted to transform into a global renewable materials company being known as the rethinkers of the industry. Swedish, Finnish, Swedish, Finnish, 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 Swedish. Well, I would say men, men, men. <laughs> men, 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 men. <laughs> exactly. If the, if, the, you know, if the picture would be even more beautiful, I can also say everyone has a light blue shirt except for this guy. He has a white one. Okay. 
If you look at experience, I had outside industry experience, so did he, but the rest are experience from the paper, a bit of board experience. That's, that's the experience that they have. So this guy left six months after the meeting to become the CFO in an energy company. All others stayed. Why do you think they stayed? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is you know very true. That's a part of the answer. They did not have anywhere else to go. If you think disruption, a transformation brings a disruption not always to a company, but often to an industry. If you're very well anchored and experienced in an industry, these people didn't have other companies to run off to, because these companies were doing as bad or worse than we did, so they didn't have an option. But it wasn't the only reason why people didn't leave. Exactly. And for me as a relative newcomer, I was moved by this. These people had worked in the company for a long time. They'd been part of imposing enormous pain to the company. They didn't want to leave that way. They want to be part of rebuilding this company because they actually love the company. Which sounds a bit like softy la la, you know, but it was very true in this case. And it moved me because I didn't actually think that would exist. Okay. Let me say some few words about what these three days led to. You know, you have this absolutely brilliant group of people talking for three days about what shall we now expect from ourselves as leaders? Because we realize that the only leadership we practice has been short term, cut costs, do whatever it takes to make us move from red numbers to black numbers. And this was what they, you know, the team concluded on. And I'll, I'll talk to this very, very swiftly. And then I'll ask you a question again, as I often do. But the first conclusion was, we need to, as leaders, be extraordinarily good in understanding customer needs. Not just the current, but also, but also possible future customers. In the part of the business that is new, where we might work with clients we don't have a clue about today. Example, H&M. Today, Storenz is providing uh, alternative to cotton to H&M that has clothes produced from trees, positioned as climate-friendly clothes, just as an example. So you need to understand the customer. You need to understand how you make money out of that, short-term, mid-term, long-term, because if not, you're going to find yourself back in 2006 before you know it. Thirdly, we need to be ethically very strong. Now when we expand globally, we need to have the ethical cord of this company run straight through it. We need to be an organization where people feel inspired and motivated, not because they're running from death, but because they actually aspire for something. People management as a clear line of sight from the strategy down to the individual contribution. And we shall give each other feedback and coaching so that we grow together. Now, here comes the question. Immediately after this meeting ended, we put a survey together where we asked our direct reports, 110 in total, to rate the executive team at this time on each of these five supported by seven underlying behaviors. So what does customer need look like in a behavior from an executive committee member? And the same for the other four. And my question to you is, where were the ranking the highest and where was the lowest? So you can pick from the five, where do you think the executive team were ranked very, very well? Uh, business acumen was almost like off the scale. I think a 9.7 in average you know, as a score from, on a scale from one to 10. Where do you think it came out the lowest? Inspire and Motivate was almost off the scale at the other end and people management were slightly above and these two were sort of hanging somewhere in the middle. We then did the same thing for 625 managers that brought us three levels down and the scores were the same. <coughs> Which I think tells you something about you know, the, the sort of leadership you've fostered and applauded and recognized is setting the culture for the organization you're sitting with. 
the realization that we came out with following this was we are so ill-wired to realize what we now want to realize, be more customer-centric, work with new customers, be more innovative, be known as the rethinkers of our industry. We couldn't be worse off at the start of the second half than what we were. Okay. Uh, this I've addressed. This was when we reach, reached out and started to work with IMD. And the reason why we started to work with IMD was that we wanted an enabling partner. We wanted to give the trust to our own people mainly, but we needed to get a partner that enabled us to perform. Okay. Then we did this, and I'll, I'll address this swiftly. This is a, a job ad, meaning this is an ad that was put out to the organization in April of 2011. It was put out for all, at that time, about 21,000 people to see. And anyone from an operator to receptionist to a vice president in manufacturing or whatever could apply. And the logic here was that the CEO said, this is not the executive team that will take us into the future but I need you to run the current business. But I need rethink coming into the executive team, otherwise we're gonna fail. So therefore I need a second executive team. And I want the people that join that team to come from within, not from outside. So that's the backdrop, and then the ad went out. And my question to you is, what do you think the reaction was to the ad? People got enthusiastic, absolutely. Some people got enthusiastic. Any other thoughts? <laughs> What's behind the, you're sitting there laughing a bit. You're inviting me to help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We're not inviting you to help, we're inviting you to help. <laughs> but there were other reactions, yeah? There was enthusiasm, but there was more to it as well. Come on. So here the CEO is saying, I don't know how to do this exactly. I need help. So what kind of reactions do you think that? Well, I got scared. <laughs> <thinking> no. <laughs> exactly. I got a phone call from a guy who was the first line supervisor in the mill. He said, for years, we've been wondering if the executive team know what they're doing. <laughs> With no, this, we know, we know <laughs> you don't have a clue. So very strong negative reactions, very strong positive reactions, very mixed reactions. Okay. In the end, after a, a process of selection, we selected these people plus one who was sick, not on the picture, and this group should work with this group on four selected strategically critical priorities. Example, how to grow product segment X in Southeast Asia. Just this one example. Second example, how to cut lead time in wood products because we lost enormous amounts of money because we were too slow. So this group worked with this group. What do you think that was like? Were they people from all levels of the company? Yes, so these people are not necessarily just young and promising talents. You know, this guy, 54 at the time. Um, this guy, a Polish guy, 46 at the time. This guy, Chinese guy, 47 at the time. So they came from all you know, parts of the world, and some of these people were four to five levels down from the executive team. So do you think it was good experiences or bad experiences? For the diversity, the, the concept is quite, quite big. Yeah. It's only professional levels, but also cultural. One thing that is to be noted is that this group, whilst they kept their role, went into this experience, they spent a lot of time at IMD being enabled by faculty from IMD. So they, they learned a heck of a lot that these people didn't know. But I can tell you that there was enormous amounts of conflicts in between these two. These people, except for the CEO and maybe to a degree me, but these people felt like you show no respect, you don't have a clue, you should shut up. Okay, these people felt like, well, we're mandated by the CEO to speak our mind, to get different perspectives in. We're being told to shut up. This is a, you know, charade. So enormous conflict. 
But we did it for seven years, and it, we sort of learned that this is the way to work. So, you know, it didn't take too long before it started to change radically. I can also say that there were people here that changed. And the new people coming in, they realized that, oh, so that's the way we work here. And that's very different. To change from one way of working to another or to step into an organization and work in a new way and sort of just accepting that that's the norm here. Okay. I'll move to impact and then, and then we close. But I just wanted to mention some few other things that we did, and I will not talk to them a lot. Leadership, we did a lot from these five expectations to try to touch everyone. So leadership became an incredibly big priority. And I'll come to how we also kept track of this and measured it and acted upon it. We identified two differentiating capabilities that we developed. We actually started to hire again. So the firing company became all of a sudden the hiring company. What do you think, if you're coming out of a very difficult time like this, what do you think you might use as a value proposition to attract people to come and join such a company? Any thought? How do you pff, make people of oh, still would answer, that's a cool place to be. Resilient company. Resilient company? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's, that was actually something that we used. Anything else that comes to mind that we could use to attract people? And you said challenges as well. I remember when we gathered 26 line managers to discuss how do we actually pitch ourselves, the conclusion was this. Uh, now I don't have the ad here, but it said, we have many challenges in big and bold that can become your opportunities. And then the text read, if you want to come to a dining table organization doing well, fantastic, don't come here. But if you want challenges that you can be part of actually turning into opportunities, this is a cool place to be. I honestly wasn't sure that that would bite. But then I was thinking, you're not sure that would bite. Why the hell did you join <laughs> for exactly that reason? Okay. We addressed the rewards, and of course, no longer a one-year incentive plan. We pulled out the long-term perspective. We incentivized the right behaviors back to the five. That's not rocket science, but we did it very, very hard. And on others, rethinking how to engage everyone. Now, it's hard to see from the back, but this is a picture of the top 150 meeting that had been rethought and redone. So up until 2011, the top, the top meeting or the top leadership meeting was a bit like this. CEO stands in front of the troops, applaud them for the year that has passed. Talks a bit about the direction for the future. Big divisional head steps up, says sort of the same thing. And then all other <coughs> divisional heads has to get up there. You come to lunch, people are very tired. After lunch, the biggest staff person gets to say something, normally the CFO. People are very tired. A funny person gets up on stage, pulls some jokes, people laugh. Then you do group work. People are not too excited about it because you did group work last year as well and nothing was done on the basis of it. Dinner, you dance. Okay, That's normally the way we had done it. And then we decided that, okay, rather than having the top 150, we invite the top 50. But we have in total 250 people participating at the meeting. And the other participants are pathfinders and path builders. And then we allow for about 150 people to apply to be present. And we had a selection process so that anyone could be there that wanted to be there. Which was, I can tell you, by the 100 that had always been <coughs> invited that were no longer invited, they hated this beyond anything. But for the energy and the bus and the engagement of the organization, invaluable. I'll show impact and this will be very brief and then I'll just give you my closing words on what I think HR's role could be not necessarily should be because it's so contextual I will address impact from the point of view of business culture and say something on people so what you see here hard to see from the back 
This is 2006 going into the first half of the transformation. The yellow is paper sales. The yellow is paper EBIT, so the operational EBIT. This is 2018. This is paper sales, and this is paper EBIT. And it's still a not too small part of Storenzo's business. Very much niche business. The exclusive magazine paper where the buying patterns still from clients are, you'd rather buy the exclusive magazine so you can touch it than reading it online. So selected segments. And the other is the growth business. The share price has more than doubled. And the company went out to brand itself the renewable materials company. Because by doing this, you can stake a claim in totally different industries with sort of a level of confidence that the company didn't have until then. Culture. <coughs> These are four indexes that meshes leadership so that every leader, 3,200 leaders, got an index on their leadership based on the five expectations ranging from zero to 100. And the aggregated score for all leaders was 72, was 81 in 2017, and the latest numbers now are 84. But I didn't actually have access to put those in, but they came with the annual report. The other indexes here is team, engagement, and rethink. But there is one favorite measure that I have, and that is this. Well, by the way, do you know this scale, the net promoter score scale? There was one person in the company who said, not me, not the CEO, but he said, if you think leadership is so important to drive this transformation, why not ask the most direct question you can think about that has to do with leadership? And it was this. Would you recommend your manager to a colleague? And every individual manager got a net promoter score. The aggregated score in 2012 was minus 10. That's like horrible. It says a lot about how bad leaders we had back then. And then based on development of leaders, but also weeding out leaders that didn't cut it, it's now at minus, oh, sorry, at plus 28. And the latest score for 2018 is plus 30. It's not super good, but it's a lot better. Also, would you recommend Storans as an employer? Minus 17. In 2013, minus 26 because we realized that we needed to fire an additional 3,500 people when people started to get hope that we were through the tunnel. And then up to plus 15 and now plus 22, which is not exceptionally good, but it's a lot better. Remember this picture? It's not perfect diversity, but first I can say that there's one person still here on this picture. Can anyone spot that one? No. It's impossible to see. You can guess from function, maybe, rather, because it's this guy. Any guess on what his function might be? No, because that's me. I'm here. No. <laughs> one, one more guess. No. Head of legal. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's a cheap shot. You should have gotten that one. <laughs> okay, what is noticeable on this one as well is that this guy, guy was not in the room, but he was hired shortly after into one other position and was later promoted. So what's noticeable from this is that promoted from within, promoted from within, the guy that is still there, <coughs> Promoted from within, she replaced me when I left. Hired from outside, promoted from within, hired from outside, promoted from within, hired from outside, promoted from within, promoted from within. So a lot of people that were actually pulled up from within the organization. Also noticeable to, s to say that the two biggest divisions still in Storenzo is paper and packaging. This is the uh, head of the packaging division. This is the head of the paper division. And I'm just saying this because I think it's also diversity from a gender point of view into the big, big business positions. OK. 
Are you with me so far? And this is going to be my last uh, sort of points of views, and, and then we just open up for a discussion. My view, be a student of context, making sure that this view or this understanding is also held by others. And I say this because I think too often do you run off and try to drive a transformation as maybe others have driven, driven a, a transformation. And you're not mindful enough about the absolute uniqueness of your own organization. What's your recent history? What is good and bad in your culture? What's the way to talk? How direct can you be? There are so many aspects of your culture that is absolutely unique. If you don't know it, the risk is high that you pull in others to drive this transformation that don't have a clue. And then we're back to what you said. You're doing a violence to a culture that people actually care for. And you run this transformation in a brutal, you don't have a real clue of where you are kind of way, and you disengage people. It won't work. And I think HR has a tremendous role to play in understanding this. And I think it's the biggest sort of, the, the, the responsibility when it comes to this rests most upon the CHRO in the executive team, I would argue. Involve others for quality and engagement. And this comes from a study, you won't see this from the back, but it's a study by Bain that is quite intriguing. It talks about what's the importance of strategy relative to the importance of engagement. And it shows that it's much more important to have an engaged organization than it is to have absolute, absolute precision on your strategy. So you need to invite people to contribute and have points of views. To sort of orchestrate that, HR has a very important role to play. Because this is not, not, not necessarily something that executives want to sort of, why don't we say that we don't really know? Why don't we invite people to contribute? It doesn't necessarily come by default. I think HR has a big role to play to make that happen. Prioritize, understand that less is more. Of course, this is not just HR's responsibility, but I think we have an important role and a favorable role to play because we're by some viewed as a more neutral player on the executive team. So we can play that facilitating difficult role to say, will the organization really master these many priorities? Focus on leadership, I think I've said enough about that. Attend to the few differentiating capabilities that will make you win less so rather than more capabilities. When we work with clients, I see very, very many clients go after too much in terms of building capabilities. And they spend enormous amounts of time on capabilities that are sort of me too capabilities rather than really focus in on the ones that is going to differentiate you from competition and make you win. Think and act systemically, making sure actions are coordinated. How many times do we not meet with clients that may say, we shall be very agile? And then we ask them, can we see your strategy process? And it's like six months long. And do you have any plans to change the strategy? No, we're talking agile now. Hmm. And you ask questions about reward structures, etc., and you might reward exactly what you do not want. So unless you think about this systemically, back to this model on strategy, structure, etc., it's very difficult to succeed. HR plays a role in that. I'm sure you're very proud of what you know. But I think this has been an issue for the profession for at least a long time when I was in the profession. We weren't strong enough about the extreme importance of the skills that we carry in human resources. It was like, we have a seat at the table. We understand the business. Yeah. But what do you actually bring? Well, we bring insight and expertise into leadership, to culture, to how you engage in an organization. We shall be masters at this. And if we are, we're not just at the table. We make a huge difference at the table. And finally, this is not just an expectation on HR, but it's certainly something that we see a lot of at IMD when we work with clients. For an organization to transform, we argue that leaders truly have to transform. You cannot have 
a leadership team that says we just need to be so much more agile and innovative, fast moving, open to working with partners, if the leadership team doesn't live that way. So you really need to reinvent yourself to be able to reinvent an organization. And there are unfortunately a lot of proof points that that's actually quite difficult to do. So. But these are my, my humble views, and these are not like necessarily IMD's views, but these are my humble views from experience and, and research. And with that, I'll be quiet for a while.